Hey everybody, how's it going? Hope you're good. Welcome back to another episode of the Chronicles of Aguna, the Arsenal podcast with me, your host, Harry Simeon. And on today's episode, we're going to be talking about a lot of the same things as as we have been discussing over the last few days, because guess what? There aren't any new names linked, really, not credibly anyway. Um, And we're receiving sort of minor updates on the situations that we know are currently ongoing. So I'm going to bring you up to speed with what we know uh, based on the reports that we are reading. And um, yeah, we'll get into those subjects. Hopefully I can offer a slightly alternative angle to maybe what we've been discussing in the past. I I sort of went back um, through the comments section on yesterday's show and I was actually surprised. And it's fine. Like, you don't have to agree with me on everything. I'm absolutely fine with people disagreeing and voicing that in the comment section. And generally speaking, it's all pretty respectful, but disagreements happen, right? And I've got, as I say, no issue with people having a different view on this, but I was a bit taken aback by how many of you were saying, what are you talking about, Harry? We shouldn't concede when it comes to the Eddie and Ketia negotiation. We shouldn't even allow Marseille to get away with paying four or five million quid less for the deal to go through. It sends a bad sort of message. It's not the right thing to do as Arsenal Football Club. I just think that with this rumbling on, the likelihood of us signing an attacking player is reducing all the time. Now, I still think for what it's worth that we will sign an attacking player. I still think we're going to sign a midfielder as well. And we'll talk about Mikel Marino a little bit later on in the programme. But it just to me, feels like this is just a a bit of an obstacle that's in the way he wants to go. Um, You know, he wants Marseille. He doesn't want anybody else based on what we're hearing. We don't even know that anybody else has a concrete interest in Eddie and Ketia. So as I said yesterday, I I just don't see the point in digging our heels in over the sake of four or five million euros when, you know, that's the difference between the deal going through being done, Arsenal, getting those funds in place to be received, okay, later down the line, but still it's guaranteed money coming in. Um, It's pure profit because he's a homegrown player and all the rest of it. And it's obviously a move that he'd quite like to make as well. So it just feels like it works for everybody. And if you're going to allow that deal to potentially fall apart on the basis of four, five million quid, it just feels to me like it's Arsenal being a little bit pedantic. I don't know. That's just my opinion on it, but we'll get into what the update is around this situation. So on today's show, we're going to talk Eddie and Ketty. We're going to talk Mikel Marino, and we're going to discuss Pedro Neto's imminent move to Chelsea. What is he doing? We'll get into that on today's episode of the Chronicles of Aguda. Don't forget to leave a like on the video. If you're watching us on YouTube, if you're listening on audio, then please do leave us a review and make sure you're subscribed on whichever platform's it is that you prefer, right? Let's get into then uh, our first story. We're going to begin by bringing you the latest on the Eddie and Ketia situation because it feels like yesterday there were some kind of minor updates around it. We'll get into that right after this very brief pause. Don't go anywhere. Okay, so literally minutes after we finished the show yesterday, literally minutes after I pressed publish, we got a, a notification from David Ornstein. I think I published the show at 11, 11.01, 11.02, and at 11.10, he dropped this update. He said, Arsenal are ready to sanction Eddie and Ketia's move to Marseille. The proposed deal is a season-long loan plus an obligation to buy in the region of 30 million euros. Personal terms for the 25-year-old striker have been agreed. It's a five-year contract. But the ball is now in Marseille's court to decide whether they should proceed or not. So just rewind for a minute. 
What this means is that proposed deal is not necessarily what Marseille have offered. It's what Arsenal have said they will accept for Eddie and Ketia. So the fact that Arsenal are the ones kind of saying, well, if you give us this, then we can move forward. And being quite specific in all of that, in terms of the, you know, the fact that the fee is clear, um, that the, the obligation part is clear. Um, they're obviously willing to accept the season uh, long loan initially, um, which suggests that, again, there's nobody else in the race. And that's why, um, you know, they're happy to sanction that. I'm sure they'd have preferred a straight up sale, of course. But we've talked a lot about what we kind of owe to Eddie as a football club as well. And I think that if it's a move that Eddie wants and there doesn't appear to be a queue of clubs waiting to sign him. And, you know, we we're going to have to concede a little bit in terms of the structure of the deal, i.e. it means we're going to get paid later down the line. It is going to be initially a loan. Then we're, we're obviously willing to do that, which is why I find it difficult to to kind of get my head around the idea of this deal potentially falling away for the sake of four or five million euros. We've made so many concessions along the way. You could argue, well, we shouldn't be making any more, but I feel like this is a deal that works for everybody. But what we heard a little bit later on was that Marseille are still not where they want to be on this. They don't believe, they don't feel that Eddie and Ketia is worth 30 million euros, or at least they don't want to pay that. So we have put this on the table and said, this is what we want. I'm sure there's a little bit of room for negotiation if Marseille um, feel that that is what they want to do. I'm sure there's a bit of wiggle room in that. David Ornstein does say that the buy obligation would be in the region of 30 million euros rather than 30 million euros on the nose. So that suggests that there is a little bit of wiggle room. One more offer, one more bid. Is that going to get this done? I hope so. As I say, I had a bit of a moan on yesterday's show about all of this because I feel like, you know, we we need to do this deal for everybody involved. I, I just the thing that really gets under my skin and, you know, I know this isn't the majority of people that listen to this podcast or watch the channel. I know this is a very small but seemingly loud minority on social media. I just find it really ironic that for years I've had to defend, as have others, Eddie and Ketia against what I believe to be unfair criticism. He's got limitations. He's not an Arsenal starting level centre forward. We all agree on that, okay? But I've heard stuff like championship striker. That's all he is. Get rid of him. Why is he still at the club? What a waste of space. Can't believe we're paying him 100k a week. Those same people are the same people today who are sitting there going, oh my God, we can't sell. We can't get 30 million quid for Eddie and Ketia. Edu, you're useless. Arteta, you're useless. Arsenal, you're useless. What are you lot doing? Why can't we get 30 million for him? Everybody else can get 30 million for him. Now, obviously, Eddie and Ketia's value is dictated by uh, how much he plays, the impact that he has, and all of that stuff, his contract length, all of that stuff, his age, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But do you not think for a minute that you look stupid if you've been sitting there saying championship level striker and then six months down the line, you're sitting there demanding, demanding that Arsenal get in excess of £30 million for a player that you said is only good enough to play in the championship. Like, the people lack self-awareness that badly to the point where, you know, these people are saying this stuff. It drives me mad. Um, but the update on this is at the moment that uh, the ball is very much in Marseille's court. Suggestions that they're still uh, not in a place where they are willing to pay the 30 million euros. Um, I feel like we've tried to squeeze as much out of them as we possibly can. Um, we've made some concessions in terms of the structure of the deal. Um, I personally think, you know, looking at the fact that there isn't that many other clubs interested and it's it's a really difficult uh, situation. I just think that we might have to make one more concession and I know people won't like that. And that's probably on the overall fee. We probably have to drop it down a little bit to around about maybe 26, 27 million euros, which would be 21, 22 million pounds. It's not what we wanted to get, of course, but you know, it is what it is. You're dictated to by the market, unfortunately, and by the demand. Um, Bournemouth have since been linked with Eddie and Ketia as well, because, of course, they've sold Dominic Solanke to Spurs. He had the first part of his medical last night, signed his contract um, with them. 
And so Bournemouth could well be in the market for a striker. But, you know, it's tough because do you wait around? Like, if Bournemouth want Eddie Nketiah, they'll be well aware of the fact that he's close to joining Marseille or that there is talks ongoing and that, you know, this is a deal that feels like it could happen in the coming days. Then they need to be fast about it. They need to be quick about it. Now, in the case of Bournemouth, a Premier League side, if they were to come in and this was to become a Premier League to Premier League transfer, then I look at this very, very differently. In that instance, I'm saying, nope, that's my valuation and I'm sticking to it. And I'm demanding £30 million because I know what you've just got in for Solanke. I know that Premier League to Premier League deals tend to be bigger because I keep talking about the market. Now I'm selling to a totally different market if that were to be the case. So should Bournemouth come in um, in a late attempt to sign Eddie and Ketia, then my outlook on this completely changes. But when you're talking about selling to Liga and in France, then I think it's a, it's a completely different conversation. And the fact that people can't separate between the two markets, it drives me crazy because there is a real difference. There is a vast difference. Marseille are a 10 times bigger club than Bournemouth, if not even bigger than that. But the finances in France compared to the finances among the Premier League clubs are very, very different. And you have to factor that in. Anyway, uh, the irony of all of this will come in our next story where we're going to talk about Mikel Marino. The irony of all the Eddie and Ketia stuff and us getting our noses put out of joint because somebody's trying to lowball us is, is, is really funny when you then look at the Mikel Marino stuff. Because according to some of the reports in Spain, Arsenal are trying to do exactly that to Real Sociedad for Mikel Marino. According to some reports, uh, Arsenal have offered 25 million euros there or thereabouts, uh, but Real Sociedad want closer to the 35 million euro mark. Now, if we were to pay 35 million euros, we'd still be within the 30 million pound kind of limit that I said um, is what I'd go to to get Mikel Marino. But again, a bit like the Eddie and Ketia stuff, which has been uh, reported by so many different people and in so many different ways over the last few days. We've got some conflicting reports doing the rounds on this. Team News and Ticks says that he'll be an Arsenal player next week. Uh, Con Harrison has reported uh, a £17 million fee has been agreed, uh, which works out to just under, uh, what does that work out on, uh, to just under €20 million. Euros. So, I mean, I keep reading all sorts on here, but my own personal position on this remains the same. I don't bloody know what's happening. Couldn't tell you if Mikel Marino is close to joining Arsenal. Couldn't tell you what the price is going to be. Um, as I say, so much going around that there is a part of me that feels like people are starting to guess a little bit. If you say, you know, if you keep, bear with me. If you keep hearing people say that the deal is close and then you put something out there like he's going to be an Arsenal player next week, there's a chance that that's going to come off, right? Again, I don't claim to be in the know. I'm not seeking to discredit anyone's information, but I just I look at all these reports. I look at how contradictory they are to one another. I look at the fact that this thing has been rumbling on for ages and ages and ages. And I'm just got to the point where I'm just going to sit back and wait and see what happens. Do I want him at Arsenal? Yes, I think he'd be a good addition to the squad. Do I have a limit with regards to what I would pay for him? Absolutely, I do, because of his age, um, et cetera, et cetera. And because of his contract situation at Sociedad too, yes. But let's just see what happens on this one. So basically what I'm saying is that there is no real update on Mikel Marino. Just a few conflicting reports flying around. And if any of these are genuine updates, we're going to find that out, aren't we, over the coming days and into next week. He is injured at the moment. He's got a slight muscular strain, uh, apparently, which kept him out of their game against, I think it was Union Berlin. Uh, a lot of people looked at that and went, well, he's not part of the plan to play against Union Berlin. And um, and so that means a, a deal and a move to Arsenal is imminent. But, um, you know, we've heard quite a bit out of Spain that that is due to an injury. So um, I guess we've got to take that at face value for now, right? Because we don't know any different. Okay, we're going to move on and we're going to talk uh, a little bit about Pedro Neto, who I thought, I have to say, we might well make a move for towards the end of the window. It's not to be, though. He's heading elsewhere. 
Now, I was filming with the boys on ESPN uh, yesterday when this news dropped, and I have to say I was gobsmacked by it. Uh, according to David Ornstein, Chelsea have reached an agreement with Wolverhampton Wanderers to sign Pedro Neto. The fee is 60 million euros plus 3 million euros in add-ons. The 24-year-old Portuguese international winger is set to undergo a medico medical soon before completing the transfer from Wolves to Chelsea. Now, I understand why Chelsea want him. I mean, I would argue and I would make the point that right wing is a position in which they're very, very well stocked. I don't think it would have been their priority or at least should have been their priority going into the summer. But Enzo Maresca clearly, um, you know, feels that work needs to be done there. I mean, that's the question. Is it Enzo Maresca? He came out the other day and he said that, of course, the, the coach has input in transfer decisions, which I thought was a bit of a silly move because when Graham Potter's uh, sort of tenure was going poorly. For a long time, he hid behind the fact that Chelsea had given him this bunch of players, players that he didn't even necessarily want. And he was finding it quite difficult to get them all uh, working in a cohesive and impactful, effective unit. Maurizio Pochettino, the first half of last season, got a free ride from a lot of people who said, well, look at the mess that he's walked into. There's so many players. He's got to figure out uh, who's right, who's not, and how to get the best out of them. Enzo Maresca saying what he said, I think, puts a little bit more pressure on him than any of those two guys had to face. Uh, so I don't really understand why he did that. But let's assume that he does want Pedro Neto. Is it responsible from Chelsea to go out and drop that kind of money on another right winger, particularly given his patchy injury record? Now, there was a tiny part of me, as I say, that thought that late on in the window, you might see Arsenal go in and try and tempt Pedro Neto away from Wolverhampton Wanderers. There was a part of me that thought, if we can go in with a 40, 45 million pound offer, that maybe, maybe that's a deal that could be done, depending on Wolves' need and depending on how hard the player pushes from his side. I did not for a second think he'd be heading to Chelsea. We've been linked for an age, and I really, really like the player, but my only reservation about him has always been, can he stay fit enough for long enough? And Therefore, is that the best use of your money? But he's on his way to Stamford Bridge. And what does that make him? Player 46, 47. Um, so, you know, perhaps game time will be limited. Um, you know, I'd imagine that if they're dropping this on him, well, you want to imagine because you want to believe that a football club at that level is being run somewhat sensibly. I know with Chelsea, they've proven time and time again that that is not the case. But You'd imagine that he'd go into the team. That kind of investment, that calibre of player, you'd imagine that he's going to play regularly. But I was thinking about it and I was thinking, like, would I have really liked Pedro Neto? And those of you that have been listening to the show for a long time will know that I've always said this about Pedro Neto. Fantastic talent, fantastic footballer, but my only problem is fitness. And then I got thinking about how impactful he's been in the Premier League, just generally speaking, because... You know, there's a lot of hype around Pedro Neto. And I thought in my head that maybe he'd scored 30, 40 Premier League goals since he's been here. You know, OK, maybe 30 if I'm being fair. And then I dug into it a little bit. And I did come across a couple of tweets that prompted me to go onto the Premier League's website and have a good look at this. And this is what I found. Gabriel Magalhaes, Arsenal's centre-half. OK, he's played 20-odd games more than Pedro Neto in the Premier League but he's got three more goals than him. One's a centre-half and one's a winger. Now, I know that people will say, you're just trying to discredit Pedro Neto because he's going elsewhere. And I promise you that is not what I'm trying to do. I promise you I rate the player. And I promise you I understand that stats don't always tell the full story. But this, this stat here, the fact that Gabriel, Arsenal's big old centre-half, has got three more Premier League goals than Pedro Neto, and that he's only played 20-odd more games than him in the Premier League. And, and you compare the two positions and the, the chances that they get and all the rest of it. This absolutely blew my mind. I find this to be a stunning statistic. I've said it before, I'll say it again. I like Neto for what it's worth. And my main concern around him has always been his fitness. But I guess what I was demonstrating by putting this out is that his impact, the impact that he's had in the Premier League to date, is often overplayed. And I don't really know why that is. I think he's a really aesthetically pleasing player in terms of the low centre of gravity, the trickery, the, the, 
the pace, the sharpness with which he does things. And so naturally that leads to your estimations of a player being higher. I always believe when they're aesthetically pleasing, there'll be those people that, you know, in this instance, choose to sometimes overlook the statistics and go with the eye test, if you like. And Pedro Neto certainly passes that. But you cannot tell me that his impact in the Premier League since he arrived has not been overplayed. Those stats prove that point, in my opinion. So am I heartbroken that he's not coming to Arsenal and that he's going to Chelsea? I wouldn't say heartbroken. Is there a part of me that thought that we might, might try and get Pedro Neto in towards the end of the window? There was, but that has obviously gone away now because he is Chelsea bound. I guess when you take your Arsenal hat off for a minute and you, you look at this situation, the biggest shame is for Pedro Neto because I just don't see Chelsea. And, I'm, you know, Maresca might change things and things might look much better this season. Who knows? But I just don't see that as an environment that that many players can succeed in at the moment. And I think when you add to the fact that he's, you know, repeatedly had injury problems and that there's a good chance that he's missing for a chunk of games next season and the fact that there is so many players in that squad, it could lead to him almost getting lost and sort of drowning in the abyss of Chelsea Football Club. So, yeah, um, not sure that's the right move for Pedro Neto. It's probably a good bit of business for Chelsea. I'm sure the Chelsea fans will look at it face value and say, good player, good acquisition, good addition. But yeah, I just, I feel for Pedro Neto. It's not a move that makes a, a great deal of sense. But hey, let me know your thoughts in the comments section below. Uh, Arsenal have put uh, a proposal on the table to Marseille over what it's going to take to get Eddie and Ketia. But Marseille, at the time of recording, uh, have yet to say that they will move on that. Should Arsenal just allow the price to be dropped ever so slightly to get the deal done? I think so. You're probably going to disagree. What is actually going on with Mikel Marino? Who knows? Because everybody and their dog seems to have an update. Only all of them contradict one another. Uh, and Pedro Neto going to Chelsea. Bit of regret on Arsenal's part. Should we have tried earlier to get him in the door? And if we did, would we have succeeded in doing so? Let me know your thoughts in the comments section. Leave a like on the video and listen. Uh, if you're listening on Spotify, leave us a review. If you're listening on Apple, leave us a review. And I'll see you all on the next one. Until then, take care of yourselves. Goodbye.